So I have this case that I can definitely describe as bizarre. Now, I could describe it as tragic because a four-year-old boy would go entirely missing. Except for the fact that the family wasn't entirely torn up about the situation. And that's not to say that they didn't love the kid. They were devastated when he went missing. But it only took about eight months for them to get over it entirely. So, can I reiterate that this case is very bizarre? What was that, Dad? You like it when I tell you in person. Okay, Dad, we've been over this. There's nothing wrong with two grown men talking on the phone. But, Dad, it's pouring outside. I'm just... <laughs> Hey, Dad. Well, I guess I'm just gonna tell you this story soaking wet. The year was 1912 in Opelousas, Louisiana. Meet the Dunbars. Mom and Dad are Lessie and Percy. They have two boys, a four-year-old named Robert, simply called Bobby, and they have a three-year-old named Alonzo. So that year, the parents decided to plan a trip to a cabin they owned in Swayze Lake, with invitations going out to family and close friends. The date they chose was that of August 23rd, a day that Percy was off work. Bobby and Alonzo were extremely pleased about the trip, but bad luck struck when Percy's work decided to schedule him in that day. He didn't have the heart to break it to his boys yet, because why ruin all that childlike excitement? So early on the morning of the trip, as the unrelenting heat and humidity of a Louisiana summer began its torment, 11 people arrived at the Dunbar cabin, and the plan was simple, to catch a lot of fish and have a good old fish fry that night. Shortly after everyone got settled in, Percy finally broke it to his boys and the party that his work needed him today of all days. Bobby was extremely upset about this and began throwing a fit which broke the strap of his straw hat in the process. But eventually hugs were had and Bobby bid his father farewell. With his father now gone, a downtrodden four-year-old Bobby Dunbar, instead of shooting garfish alongside his old man, was now relegated to fishing along with a close family friend named Paul Mizzy, an older boy that had taken him horseback riding before. Other kids from the party went along also, including little Alonzo. Lessie, who was usually diligent in watching her two boys, was just too overwhelmed with the preparations for the fish fry that she reluctantly allowed her boys to go along but told Paul sternly to bring them back for lunch. Paul said he understood, and off they went to play at the fishing spot. When it was lunch, Paul gathered the kids and headed back to the cabin, except when they returned, Lessie took a hold of Alonzo, but Bobby wasn't with them. A puzzled look comes over Paul's face. Lessie became frantic and began to scream for Bobby as she ran towards the fishing spot. The rest of the party, figuring something was wrong, followed right behind. Lessie, like any concerned parent, exerted herself with utter disregard for her own health, shouting and running at full pace, that by the time she got to the fishing spot, she was completely spent. She blacked out and collapsed onto the hot, humid dirt. She was carried back to the cabin as the others continued to look for Bobby. Once the police arrived, a search party was assembled to comb over Swayze Lake. Here's the thing about this quote unquote lake, and that is it would be better described as a swamp. And this swamp had alligators. The thing about alligators, they're cold blooded and they liked it best when the weather was hot as this day was. So an even better description of Swayze Lake that day would be an alligator infested swamp. The authorities were already assuming the gators got him. Even as they searched, they were also waiting for clothing or body parts to resurface. Nothing ever did. The primitive methods of combing a large body of water with strings and hooks came up empty. But Bobby's straw hat, broken strap and all, was found a good distance away from the lake. Which, if the lake coughed up nothing, detectives upped the likelihood that Bobby was kidnapped. The story was all over the Opelousas papers the following day, along with a $1,000 reward being put up by the Dunbars, which is about $25,000 in today's money. The article also came with a description of Bobby the day he went missing, and it reads as follows. Age 4 years and 4 months. Full size for age. Stout, but not fat. Large round blue eyes. Light hair and very fair skin. 
with rosy cheeks. Left foot had been burned when a baby and shows scar on big toe, which is somewhat smaller than toe on the right foot. Wore blue rompers and straw hats without shoes. The people of Opelousas were saddened by the story. They came together to raise another $5,000, but it would go unclaimed, and the family's hope began to wane as the times went on. Until eight months later, on April 13 of 1913, police arrest a man described as a traveling tinker, which is a man that walks about offering to fix things. His expertise was fixing pianos. The man's name is William Cantwell Walters, arrested over 200 miles away in Mississippi. Walters was seen traveling with a boy that fit the description of Bobby to a T, except they couldn't confirm the deformities of the left foot because it was so weathered, scarred, and caked with grime. Walters didn't do himself any favors when under interrogation. He decided to be difficult, deflecting, and giving different answers when asked who the boy belonged. He first said the boy was his. After a while, he said it was his sister's. Then finally, he said it was the son of some lady named Julia. Of course, when you give the police the old runaround, they tend to no longer believe anything you say. And the fact that the boy showed clear signs of abuse, scars from being whipped, was enough to take the boy away and put him on the next train for Louisiana, where Lessie and Percy Dunbar anxiously awaited to ID him. When that train finally arrived, Lessie, Percy, and Alonzo were joined by the authorities as well as local reporters. When the train doors opened, interestingly, two different papers gave two different accounts of the parents' reactions. One wrote that Lessie recognized Bobby right away and embraced him. The other paper wrote, that Lessie hesitated, gave him a look over and remarked that his eyes were too small. But both papers did agree that the look on the child's face didn't convey any recognition of the Dunbars. The boy even corrected them when he was called Bobby, that his name was Bruce. Regardless of which account was true, the boy was allowed to go home with the Dunbars. Maybe a familiar setting and a meal would snap Bobby out of whatever trance that Hobo Walters cast upon their boy. They take him out the following day and purchased him a bicycle. And when they noticed how happy it made him, they went ahead and got him a pony also. So by the end of a great day, the boy had warmed up to them so much that he even let Lessie bathe him. And it was while scrubbing his body, Lessie began to notice certain birthmarks and scars that she recalled. She jumped up and shouted, Thank God, it is my boy, and fainted from joy. So back in Mississippi, old William Cantwell Walters is rotting in jail, awaiting his trial for the kidnapping of Bobby Dunbar. He would proclaim his innocence, that the boy is Bruce Anderson and that his mother is a woman named Julia Anderson, who had given him the child as a traveling companion. Julia was his brother's lover and they had a boy illegitimately, which actually makes Walters the boy's biological uncle. He also wrote a letter to the Dunbars that read, I know you have decided. You are wrong. It is very likely I will lose my life on account of that. And if I do, the great God will hold you accountable. This story would be heard through the gossip rounds and was so sensational that it landed in the papers. But of course, no one believed the ramblings of a traveling tinker who they were convinced was just trying to save his own skin because if the child was Bruce Anderson, he would get a lesser charge than if the boy was Bobby Dunbar, which would most likely get him life in prison. So the whole town of Opelousas wrote off Walters as just a man trying to stay alive with lies. That is until the actual Julia Anderson came to town. Coming all the way from North Carolina after reading Walter's story in the papers, she was here to let everyone know that Walters had been telling the truth, that the boy who was now living under the name Bobby Dunbar was actually her son, Bruce Anderson. She would clarify that she did not give her son away, only allowed him to accompany Walters for a couple of days, and that was 15 months ago. Now that she's found him, she was here to get him back. But she did not waltz into a welcoming city. Opelousas already had their good story, and the good story was their boy was lost, but through a little prayer and some good police work, he is now found. And they weren't just going to let a woman come along and ruin that good story, especially since they just had a whole parade for the boy. 
The papers dug into Julia's past, and to discredit her claims, they called her an illiterate woman with loose morals, a sneak diss that she was a prostitute. They uncovered that she had three children with two different men, one daughter taken into foster care, an infant that died shortly after birth, and of course, the missing boy, spinning the story to make it seem like it was all her fault having lost her children in the span of one year. The police, whose job wasn't to judge the woman by her past, decided to give a grieving mother her fair shake. With the aid of four boys matching the description, as well as the actual child himself, she was presented each boy one at a time. And surprisingly, she too wasn't sure which one was her Bruce. The other concerning fact was that the boy had the same off-putting reaction to Julia as he did with Lessie. The odds of two different parents who cannot correctly identify their own kid, I would say, is very low. And it happened twice to the same boy in short order. So now the town was rock solid that the boy was indeed Bobby Dunbar. When Walter's trial got underway, Julia was right there backing his story. But now with her name tarnished, it didn't help his case either that the boy that wanted to be called Bruce was now telling everyone he is Bobby, a boy with nice parents, a nice home, and a bike, and a pony to boot. The Dunbars win the case, and William Can't Win Walters was given life for the kidnapping of Bobby Dunbar. But in a case like this, even the fate of the accused is wacky, because after two years in prison, Walter's lawyer was able to appeal and grant him a new trial. But he was then released on a technicality, which was, the city didn't want to pay for another trial, so they let him go. And Walters would stick to his story till his dying days. So Julia Anderson, returning home brokenhearted and childless, would share her story for generations to come. Her lineage would tell the story of how their kin Bruce was kidnapped by a family named the Dunbars. And on the Dunbar timeline, well, life simply continued because why wouldn't it when everyone is where they were supposed to be? Bobby Dunbar finishes school, fell in love with a girl named Marjorie at 18, marries her nine years later and eventually has four children. He passes away in 1966 at the age of 57 in Harris County, Texas with a gravestone that read Robert C. Dunbar. But this wacky roller coaster doesn't end yet. In 1999, his nosy little granddaughter Margaret couldn't leave well enough alone. She was told the fascinating story of grandpa's kidnapping so many times as a child that she had become enamored with it. Her father, Bobby Dunbar Jr., decided to give her a scrapbook of about 400 articles concerning the kidnapping which allowed her a way to piece together a more complete story of the one that she's been fascinated with her whole life. But she found numerous discrepancies, such as the two newspapers reporting different reactions to the meeting of Bobby and Lessie, and she started sensing that the Opelousas newspapers were on a witch hunt when it came to Julia Anderson. Their vilification of her seemed way out of line, so when she had gotten through all of her father's clippings, she was completely obsessed with the story. She would visit libraries and courthouses and pour through anything they had. That's when she came across a letter in William Cantwell Walter's defense trials that was written to the courthouse under the pseudonym of The Christian Woman. This would open her mind to the real possibility that her great-grandparents had knowingly kept the wrong boy. Dear Sir, in view of human justice to Julia Anderson and mothers, I am prompted to write to you. I sincerely believe the Dunbars have Bruce Anderson and not their boy. If this is their child, why are they afraid for anyone to see or interview him privately? I would see nothing to fear and this seems strange. If the Dunbars do not know their child, who has only been gone 8 months, by his features, why? They don't know him at all. With that, Margaret felt the logical next step was asking her dad to take a DNA test against an undeniable Dunbar, her uncle, who was also Alonzo's son. That test would conclude that their grandfather was not Bobby Dunbar. He was Bruce Anderson. So effectively, Lessie and Percy Dunbar had kept the child that they weren't 100% sure was theirs, and he wasn't. And if you stop to think about it, 
then you realize that if they willingly did this because they wanted so bad for it to be true, they basically abandoned the real Bobby Dunbar, their son, from ever being properly searched for. And if the Gators didn't get him that hot summer day, then someone got away with a kidnapping. I hope you enjoyed the story, Dad. I guess I'll go walking in the rain now that I'm dry. I love you, and I'll have another story for you shortly. <laughs>